Now bring me my finest demons! Some say there's no such thing as pure evil. Except for reality shows, video game companies, corrupt businesses, and YouTube influencers. And yet, these twisted beings from the other world pride themselves on being the living embodiments of evil and chaos. They don't even have to be high on the hellish food chain, they just relish in the misery they cause, and the fear they instill in anyone in their wake. And since it's the season of horrors yet again, what better time of year to give the demonic bosses their props? First, I want to clarify one major rule for this list. This is about demon bosses, not devil bosses. And yes, there is a difference. Do they want to be on top, or do they want to destroy everything they can? Do they want the power to be the best, to be able to do whatever the heck they want, and what they want is to hurt everything they can? The way D&D describes them, devils are lawful evil, demons are chaotic evil. With devils, there are rules, a structure, a sort of carefully cultivated engine of suffering. With demons, they're just wanton destruction incarnate. No rules, no bargaining, just hate and death for its own sake. But what really defines a demonic character? Well, for one, it really helps that the game refers to them as a devil or demon, but your average demons are defined thusly. One, they're evil spirits that tempt someone to evil or corrupt something good. Two, they're found living or born in some sort of spiritual underworld or otherworld. Three, descending from multiple cultures, especially from Judeo-Christian definitions. I know a lot of times yokai is translated to demon, but honestly, yokai feels similar to fey rather than demons. Four, if they are possessing a creature, that counts. Five. How well do they capture that unholy or desecrating feel? Like this thing is evil, cunning, corrupting, and extremely dangerous. Six, how much do they feel like the ultimate evil as opposed to the ultimate good? How well do they capture that unholy ultimate evil atmosphere as well as the flavor of non-discriminatory destruction? Seven, motivations. What gets them out of the nine circles in the morning? Eight, specifically avoiding the Eldritch or Lovecraftian. They have a very specific occult feel contrary to the corrupt divine of the demons and devils. Though rest assured, we are planning separate lists for the Eldritch and devil bosses. Nine, how much damage do they actually do? Barring that, how much could they have done? Scale matters. Wrap all that together and how much fun the actual fight is, and you've got our top 10 demonic bosses. <laughs> in the DLC for Dark Souls, Artorius of the Abyss, you travel back in time. One of the first bosses you encounter here is Artorius himself. But why is Artorius evil? From what we learned in the story, Artorius was a brave and heroic knight. Well, it was thanks to Manus, father of the Abyss. The Abyss is a plane of existence of pure nothingness that threatens to devour the entire world. Said Abyss existing is one of the reasons that the first flame needs to be lit, making Manus the one who was more or less behind everything. In terms of story category, Manus definitely nails the criteria. He corrupted a hero. He looks terrifying. He's one of the biggest sources of evil in the story. Heck, he even has 6,666 HP. Yeah, okay, that's a little on the nose. As a boss though, Manus isn't too impressive. Given everything you went through to get to him, it's the typical game of just dodging and attacking when he recovers. He does start using magic in his second phase, but you can just use pendant to deflect them. And if that's too complicated for you, you can just cheese him with dark bead. So that's why Dark Souls fans always complained about there being an easy mode. It already existed. Since the beginning of time, two primordial beings lay dormant within the Earth's core. One was the incarnation of light, appropriately named Light Gaia, also known as Chip. The other being a monster of pure darkness, simply known as Dark Gaia. As light sought the safety and well-being of all life on Earth, 
Dark desired nothing less than total destruction to all. Thus, the two must remain bound together in the center of the Earth, forever opposing one another, and thus bringing balance to the planet. Until a certain hard-boiled idiot decides to try and wake up the monstrous beastie and basically tear the planet apart. And what did Eggman plan to use all that demonic power for? A family-oriented fun park! He unleashed a world-ending demon for a theme park? It reminds me. Hey, Beelzebub, yeah, um, could you pick up some nugs on your way home? Many will recall, if you're not sick about hearing about the Blue Hedgehog by now, that I named Dark Gaia from Sonic Unleashed one of the franchise's best boss fights, and I still stand by that. For the Wii and PS2 version, anyway. The PS3 and Xbox version is mostly just roaming, dashing, and a whole lot of not really fighting anything at all. But here, it feels like a cinematic brawl of the ages. Dark Gaia and the mechanized Gaia Colossus duking it out fist to tentacles. Sonic running for his life to literally blind the Savage Beast and finally take on an upgraded, even more ferocious, perfect Dark Gaia, culminating into one last climactic duel to the death. Obviously, there's so much to love about Dark Gaia's boss fight, but why is he so low on this list? Yes, Dark Gaia's ultimate plan was to destroy the Earth, and the mere act of him waking up caused the Earth to start breaking apart. But what did he really do at the end of the day? Well, it was, uh, really scary and big. Yeah, it was really scary and big. Real big. Uh... Did I say it was scary? Yeah, that's pretty much the extent of Dark Gaia's rampage. He looked scary and fought Sonic. When you really think about it, Eggman was the one who caused the most damage. He drained the Chaos Emeralds, he woke Dark Gaia up, he jumped through hoops playing this whole global domination scheme, all for a stupid theme park. That isn't to say Dark Gaia didn't cause serious damage or have a horrifying influence. Far from it. Being so close to him during his awakening caused Sonic to develop his Werehog abilities. Several of the townsfolk ended up possessed by Dark Gaia's negative energy, which either turned them evil or depressed at night. And the most heinous crime of all, he turned half of what was actually a fairly decent game into a poor man's beat-em-up. Well, with that, I'm not entirely sure that Eggman isn't the real demon here. All joking aside, while he himself doesn't do much, you can feel the dread that his mere presence brings to those around him, and even how damaging his arrival was, which counts for a lot in our eyes. Yeah, we actually did it. We put the same boss on two boss lists in a row. Okay, I may or may not have planned this. Uh, don't worry, it isn't Fatalis for the third time, I think. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 just making sure, just making sure, double check. Uh, but it is a demonic dragon from another popular monster hunting slash catching franchise. Hey, I did say that Giratina was more demonic than Draconic, so it makes sense for Pokemon Satan to appear here once more. Honestly, the Volo fight really is the stuff of wonder. You have this mysterious merchant who appears throughout the game, and you can guess real quick that he's Cynthia's ancestor. Yeah, he even has some Pokemon from Cynthia's team with that Tokabi of his. But even with that, you can tell he was more sus than an Among Us imposter who runs out of a room with a dead body. So when he does show his true colors, you may not have been that surprised, but you were definitely hyped as heck. Volo's team itself will give you its own version of hell, though it's only the appetizer for the ghost dragon. Not only is he much stronger than any legendary you fought, bringing in those legendaries you caught just prior is a trap. He is built to wipe out every one of them, including the diamond and pearl duo. Maybe if you got Darkrai from using the brilliant diamond shiny pearl save data, though you better keep raising and training any Pokemon you bring anyways. See Dragon Bosses for a full breakdown of the fight because it is the stuff of legends. Eat your heart out, Necrozma. Now, what exactly is Giratina's motivation here? Well, easy. He wants to get to Arceus. Both him and Volo shared that desire. To that end, they ripped open the giant space-time rift in the sky, all to try and bring Poke God to them. 
Too bad for them since Arceus chose your player character as the one to actually meet him. Velda doesn't take this well and leaves, never to be seen again. As for Giratina, <laughs> you meet him one more time in the turnback cave. He's passive here. Not showing the blunt rage he had when you fought him at the spear pillar, he allows you to catch him. It's only after that you learn from Leventon that Giratina chose to protect Hisui after losing to you. Well, Giratina and Volo's actions caused the conflict in the game, and he is 100% the best fight in the game. The reason he is here is he loses a lot of the destructive force he showed earlier. Explains why he doesn't do much in the later games in the timeline. Sure, we have Platinum, but Cyrus was the one antagonizing him. Shows him, right? All right, next I want to talk about Diablo. Dude! It's kind of hard to talk about the Diablo franchise without having to think about the Yay. show that is Diablo Immortal. Gee, I can't help but ponder why, Blizzard. Fortunately, we're here to talk about a good title from the series, Diablo 2. More specifically, we're discussing the final boss of Chapter 4, the Lord of Terror himself, Diablo. Our titular Diablo is the youngest of the prime evils and arguably the most powerful and conniving. He was slain in the original game by Aiden, but then, in his infinite wisdom, Aiden jammed the only thing containing Diablo into his skull, thinking that his will was strong enough to contain the demon. And... Man cannot trust willpower alone! Why do you think they invented the summer and winter sails? In a really tragic twist of fate, the one who ended the Lord of Terror in the original game became his new vessel, with the ultimate end goal of ruling over both heaven and hell. Now his is a slower campaign to destroy the world, so it feels as if he's not as powerful as others higher on the list. So that may knock him off a few points, but... Not even death can save you from me. That does little to take away from his presence. First, you must go through at least three mini bosses and their minions before taking Diablo on. He is arguably the hardest boss in the game. The fact that his arrival manages to kill any leftover monsters is proof enough that you may be in for a fun time. Part of the challenge is how many varied attacks he's got. Claw swipes, charging, rings of fire, ice tipped claws, fire, 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 and red lightning. Luckily, he's got a tell for that one, so it's easy to dodge. Even more fortunately, he stays confined to the area, so you can briefly step out if you need to. It's all a matter of watching yourself and having the right gear to protect yourself, and you'll hopefully make it out alive. You may win the battle today, but there's always that dreaded feeling that Diablo can and will return most likely using another civilian as a vessel. The fact that he was able to corrupt the original hero and use him as a tool for his revenge paints a clear picture of the horrors the Lord of Terror is capable of. Our next segment is Goma. You call? Yes. Get out of here! Not that one. I mean the magma dwelling one. <laughs> The Goma are manifestations of evil emerging from Gaia's core to feed on all life it comes across, mostly humans. Its existence would later be revealed to specifically serve the Creator as deliberate harbingers of demise. So in that case, these monsters are demons by class, which traces all the way up to their progenitor, Vlitra Goma. Glitra is an absolutely massive fissure on the planet, spawning hordes of Goma every several thousand years. The deities made it their life's work to harvest humanity's prayers, garnering all the power they can to purge Glitra for good. Of course, our resident bag puncher came in like, Move your plan! Watch me waste all that hard work and solve your problems by being angry! And thus, Asura and his chum, Yasha, jump into Vlitra's core and confront the big bad in his molten flesh. Hauling in its own massive sets of arms, Vlitra throws heavy punches and slashes at the bros, but is no short of its own supply of geokinetics. 
It shoots flames, boulders, spires of magma, and even fires lasers from its arms. The fight is as much of a spectacle as a lot of other bosses in the game, but what really makes this fight is that we get to see Asura and Yasha's teamwork come full circle. After all the time these two were forced to butt heads and got caught up by Deus for ganging up on him, seeing the two finally let out their dual combo on this absolute beast of an end boss is super cathartic. Admittedly though, Velitra doesn't have much of a character to speak of, it's just a force of nature made to be defeated as a test by Chakravartin to find a successor. So while it is a demon, it's more like a high-end general than an ultimate evil. One that gave us a fist of fury, sure, but the top five's got much more to offer. Alright, time for the obligatory Monster Hunter entry. Okay, there can't be something that demonic. I mean, sure, we've got a plague dragon and a... Well, yeah, the vampire dragon, but... Surely there can't be something that weird, right? <laughs> mm, okay, it doesn't look that bad. Weird mouth, weird mouth! Are we sure this is an elder dragon or some eldritch horror? Well, looks like it's both. Meet Gazemagorm, the final boss of Monster Hunter Rise's expansion, Sunbreak. Throughout the game, you end up chasing after the vampire dragon Malzeno and the parasitic organisms on its body, the Curio. Well, even after killing Malzeno, the Curio appeared to still be kicking. In the Gathering of the Curio quest, you see the aftermath of their rampage on the Citadel where every endemic life and small monster are either gone or dead. No music plays. You find super strong monsters like Zenogre and Garangolm just as a corpse. At the end of the quest, you see the reason behind all of this. The Archdemon of the Abyss. Everything that happens from here just escalates. You get a cutscene where you see the Admiral just launch three Dragonators into this beast. And he's still up. The fight begins from here. You dive into its own abyss and you see how Freaking huge this thing is! Time to attack the arms as doing so will break the gems on its back. Which are crystallized parasites, by the way. What the fuck? Yay. Despite how huge he is, he moves pretty well, so it's hard to keep up with some of the better weak points. In this first phase, he throws his arms at you and causes explosions with them. At one point, you're able to use the Dragonator symbol, which will rain Dragonators from up high straight onto him, allowing you to attack the head for a bit. You know when the first phase ends, when we get a cutscene and see the big devil get absolutely wrecked by a large dragonator and then explodes on its head. That was just phase one. We still got plenty to go. After diving even further, the crystal's eyes back become flames and he turns even more demonic. I mean, I say flames, but those are just the energy of the curio emanating from its back. It becomes much more aggressive, flailing his arms around, causing giant explosions, and what I can only describe as an exploding blood beam. During this phase, he may start climbing a nearby wall to reach the amalgamation of Curio higher up. At this point, you get a rotating ballista sent to you, and you need to work together to destroy the weak points on its back to send it flying down. Or else, he nukes ya! After enough damage, he will enter phase 3, where its entire body becomes inflamed from the power of the Curio. His flame attacks become more devastating and he starts using more demonic attacks like summoning an army of... Eyes of Sauron? I don't know, the attack looks awesome! Oh, and the giant sun that launches even more suns down at you! What is even this fight? Don't worry, there is a point where he tries to climb the wall again, but this time you don't get machine gun turrets to help you. So your NPC partner Fiorain decides to just jump above the turret and strike him straight down into the ground. Proof of the hero plays as you lay the final smackdown on this fearsome foe. Keep it up and you prove that the Archdemon should have stayed in the abyss. There's a reason why people consider this fight to be one of the best final bosses in recent memory for the series. It just keeps escalating in scale as you descend into the abyss. Its Curio pets are still around too as they evolve to act on their own and are the post-game mechanic too. While the lack of major screen time is what puts him here, the absolute insanity of the fight shows why Monster Hunter is still one of the kings of boss fights. Gauntlet Dark Legacy, still to this day my all-time favorite game. 
everything I love in a game topped off with decent graphics, smart puzzles, polished gameplay, and some of the fondest memories for me. I mean, who didn't get a sense of pride when they finally defeated Scorn, the Lord of the Underworld himself? After the evil mage Garm brought Scorn into the mortal realm, he tried and failed to control the demon, as Scorn bows to no one. Instead, he swats Garm like the insect he is and unleashes his entire legion of minions upon the world, quickening his ultimate takeover. To end his reign of terror, our heroes have to traverse through the desecrated temple and do battle with him, not once, but twice. First, you must face him in the Altar of Scorn, where he ascends from a pit of fire in gold-plated armor. Okay, the asterisk aside, this one is pretty straightforward. Just don't get too close, try to avoid getting hit by his spells, it's a little harder than it looks, and let him have it. Being in the high 80s is definitely recommended because he does not mess around. But hey, after you beat him here, you get first dibs at his armor. Better not waste any time because it won't last long. Of course, what kind of world would we live in if that was all you had to do? Now you must confront the Dark One himself on his turf, the Underworld. The good news is that without his armor, he's much easier to kill. The bad news is that it also makes him twice as dangerous as his attacks do a lot more damage, especially the Fire Ray. But if you can power through this round, he'll try and take one last swipe at you before completely disintegrating. And you're rewarded with coins and that heavenly message. Congratulations, the evil demon Scorn has been destroyed. He will never again threaten the eight realms. Maybe he won't, but somebody else might. The horrendous overlord of the underworld was just the opening act for the real final boss, Garm, who somehow survived and used Scorn's power to evolve into an even greater demon. Don't know if there's much I can say about Scorn, other than he's awesome, he takes crap from no one, and the fact that he succeeded in what he set out to do and corrupted someone into becoming a bigger threat really speaks volumes. Let me tell you about this one game. It's an action-adventure game where you have a silent protagonist joined by a tiny companion character. The gameplay consists of combat, exploration, and a fair bit of puzzle solving through an ancient fantasy world. That's right, we're talking about... Okami? Sure, let's see how this one coming. Since you play the goddess of the sun, Amaterasu, it only figures that your enemy is the ruler of darkness, Yami. Before the fight begins, Yami steals your brush techniques and knocks Waka out of the arena. As you slowly chip away at Yami, you relearn your brush techniques to counteract his moves, repairing the damage he causes, putting out the fire, and redirecting lightning towards him. You even play slots with him! You seemingly finish Yami off, only for him to steal all your powers yet again and even destroy the constellations they came from. Fortunately, Issen rallies the people of Nippon to cheer you back into the fight. Gee, uh, never heard that one before. Though it is justified since you're a god who lives off prayer and all that. Afterwards, you finally finish him off with all of your techniques at your disposal. The only real reason that Yami is not any higher is that the game doesn't really do much in terms of building up to him. You can't really give him any points for the more story-based criteria we have. You don't even know the guy exists until you're about three quarters of the way through. Or even asks, no, I will not replay Okami. Not even if we made it a sub goal? I. You. Um. Torture case ups? There are names that strike terror into the hearts of men. Names that people fear to speak even in the most hushed of whispers. Something as generic as Shadow Queen isn't exactly one of those awe-inspiring names. However, despite the not-so-flashy name, the Shadow Queen is truly a demon to be reckoned with. A thousand years ago, a great civilization was struck down in a single night. Darkness filled the skies and the earth roared and shook. When it was over, the civilization had been swallowed up by the earth. But what could cause such a catastrophe? No one really knew. What people did know was that they had left behind some kind of great treasure. Thus, people gathered at the spot where the civilization had fallen, 
hoping to be one of the lucky ones to find the treasure and claim it for themselves. From this gathering of treasure hunters, the town of Rogesport was born on top of the fallen nation's ruins. But as we would eventually discover, the treasure and the demon were one and the same. A rumor spread by one of the demon's minions to ensnare the greedy hearts of men. For the Shadow Queen had been sealed away behind a door locked behind seven crystal stars scattered across the world. By tempting treasure hunters to find the seven stars and bring them before the thousand year door, this minion hoped to free her queen. But there was one final piece to the puzzle. The Shadow Queen required a vessel. Only a maiden of the purest heart would do. As it happened, just as the thousand years was up, just such a maiden appeared. One, Princess Peach. With the princess in trouble, her loyal protector Mario gathered up the stars and broke the seal on the thousand year door. Now all this sounds like fairly standard demonic fare. What elevates the Shadow Queen to be the vaunted number two on this list? Presentation! As she is summoned from her slumber, the candles in the room flicker out and the red flames are replaced with ominous purple ones. The moment the Shadow Queen merely rises from her crypt, the world goes dark. Not the room, not the underground city, the whole world. This is after a thousand years trapped and still without a vessel. Oh yeah, she hasn't possessed Peach just yet. And she still exudes this feeling of unfathomable power. And when she does possess the princess, the earth shakes and lightning cracks the sky around the world. Of course, like any good demon, the Shadow Queen tries to tempt Mario to her side. Naturally, he refuses, and the fight is on. It seems to go up well first. Things seem to be on track for another victory for Mario. The Shadow Queen and Peach's body is being routed. But just when things seem hopeful, the Shadow Queen notes how she is not yet accustomed to Peach's body and releases her true self back into the world. Things go from okay to absolutely terrible, as in this state, the Shadow Queen cannot be hurt. Even Mario's most powerful attacks simply bounce off of her. As if that wasn't enough bad news, if you manage to survive the onslaught for a few rounds, the Shadow Queen makes a snack of the audience and undoes all the damage you did to her while she was still in her vulnerable peach state. Of course, the night is darkest just before the dawn. Just as all hope seems lost, the seven crystal stars shine bright for Mario and scatter to the far corners of the world. They attract the hopes and prayers of all the people Mario's met along his journey to gather them. The concentrated hopes and prayers of the people of the world flood the room, weakening the Shadow Queen enough for Princess Peach to momentarily break free and infuse Mario and his party with the last of her power. With health restored and the ability to once again do damage to the Shadow Queen, Mario jumps back into the fray. Even with this buff, this fight is no joke. The Shadow Queen is capable of dealing immense damage and loves to give herself attack and defense buffs to further complicate matters. But with a good game plan, some items, and good timing, Mario comes out on top, vanquishing the Shadow Queen once and for all. Chernobog, Kingdom Hearts. Really nice tribute to Fantasia, but likes a little oomph. For Mortis, Fire Emblem Sacred Stones, Dweller of the Sacred Stone who turned Lion to the dark side. If only this fight was harder. X-Death, Final Fantasy V. Only way this trick could be more demonic is if it starts shoving diplomatic rights in our faces. Bale slash Serial, Bloodstain. Great fights with really impious designs, but the lack of backstory makes them less interesting than they could have been. Sthertoth, Bomberman 64, the second attack. Better collect all the elemental stones because once this guy reaches full power, you've already lost. In every heart, the seed of dark abides. The makings of a lord when watered well, with hate, sweet hate, she springs eternal, sings, all tempting draught will drink of her again. The Demon King, Lord of Dark, a being that encompasses hate and sin. Odio is the overarching antagonist of Live Alive. Unlike most arch-villains, Odio isn't a single entity. Each era within the game has an antagonist that encompasses some form of sin and disdain formed by humanity's faults. Whether it's Odio's bottomless wrath, 
Odeo Bright's Untamed Envy, or OD10's Intolerance for Sloth and Ignorance. They all fall under the Dark Lord's Manifest. Odeo is no master of hate. It is hate. That's what it means in Spanish, after all, and is the root of the word odious. But none of the forms it took came even close to the absolute hellish threat that is the Fallen Knight Ersted. Crushed by the scorn of man and the loss of all that he held hope for, Ersted became the perfect vessel for Odio's grandest plan, to summon the heroes who slew its various incarnations and bring them their untimely demise. Also, it could wipe out all remaining hope of the world and destroy not just the entire world, but also everything there ever was and will be. You start off the battle by facing off against Odio's face. The eyes of Odio can attack you from far away and electrocute you, while the maw of Odio can attack multiple times between each ally's turn, dealing spread damage that can even cripple them. You definitely want to take out the maw first, preferably at a distant range, unless you have allies that can inflict recoil at close range. Additionally, you can skip phase two if you have Hong in your party and spam pork second cooking to kill the brow, since it does set damage and won't activate the counter but that's assuming you don't kill the Aizen Ma first in the process. Should you enter phase two, you'll fight Odio's most frightening and toughest form, Purity of Odio. On top of boasting a massive health pool, this form of Odio has attacks that can split your party apart and even stun them over an electric tile. It also has a really high dodge rate, so your attacks are more than likely to miss half the time. As if that's not cheap enough, therein comes its strongest attack. Saint Alethea, a gruesome shrill culminating from Ersted's own heartbreak. Despite a few luck-based elements, it's still a manageable fight that can be traversed should you deal with the right debuffs. If there's any occasion to use your best healing and stat boosting items, look no further. Once you get past all that, you finally defeated Odio and freed Ersted from its grip at least you could have, but that would require you to slay Ersted where he stands and never get to go back home. No, it's definitely not that simple. You gotta spare Ersted, in which he repays you by sending all the incarnations of Odio after you as a last resort. In the original Super Famicom title, this is pretty much where the fight ends, as your characters come up victorious against their old enemies, showing how far they've come since they've started. But in the remake, we get something much more interesting. Ersted succumbs to hatred one last time, forming the sin of Odio. And what do you know? It's a giant hand boss. Haven't had enough of that for a lifetime. This fight is a lot easier than the previous phases, as Odio's attacks are much easier to telegraph. It helps that your targets are static, so there isn't much to worry about with positioning. Then again, after how arduous the previous phases are, it's high time we have a simpler, but still very effective final stretch. It all culminates in Odio paralyzing the first group of heroes, leading to the remaining ones giving it all to land every strike that it takes and save Ersted from Odio's grip. Eventually, the remaining heroes fall to Odio's attack, but after all their effort and perseverance, Ersted finally breaks free, finishing off what's left of the demon. Few demons came even close to how absolutely grandiose Odio is. Amazingly built up lore with intricate characterization and symbolism. A really fun boss fight that's challenging, tricky, and atmospherically engaging. And all of that? topped with a legendary payoff. It's incredible how well the remake not only accentuates the themes and weight of the battle with stronger visuals and grander music, but even gave us additions that made the fight that much more satisfying and worthwhile. 28 years of legacy and seeing gaming's greatest demon return in brand new colors is worth every second. I'm Josh Scorcher and Ugh. This demon talk is making me feel dirty. Let's cleanse myself. He ransoms me and keeps me safe from the battle waged against me.